Hello, welcome to Assessing Dermal Exposures to Nanomaterials. My name is Pete Rayner. I'm an Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Before going further, I would like to acknowledge Jen Samo, who is a Senior Managing Health Scientist at Cardinal Chemrisk and a PhD student at the University of Minnesota, for sharing instruction materials that were used in part to create this lesson. By the end of this module, learners should be able to prioritize nanomaterial exposures based on rod of exposure, recognize determinants of dermal exposures to nanomaterials, describe qualitative and quantitative approaches to assessing dermal exposures, and identify sampling and analytical methods to assess dermal exposures to nanomaterials. People at work can be exposed to hazards by a variety of routes. We think of inhalation exposures most often. However, there is also a potential for ingestion exposures, especially from materials that first deposit in the respiratory tract and then are brought up through the mucociliary escalator and swallowed. During this lesson, of course, we'll be focusing on dermal exposures, exposures to the skin. There are other exposures, ocular exposures, exposures to the eye, auditory exposures to elevated sound levels, and whole body exposures to hazards like radiation and vibration. Workplace exposures to nanomaterials occur primarily through two routes, the inhalation and dermal routes. As depicted in this diagram, inhalation of engineered nanomaterials can occur if nanomaterials are released into the air and move into a worker's breathing zone. Alternatively, workers may receive dermal exposures if they handle nanomaterials directly. In addition, airborne nanomaterials can deposit directly onto a worker's skin, or they can deposit onto clothing or work surfaces and be transferred to a worker's skin when the clothing or surface is touched. So, dermal exposures may occur from direct contact with nanomaterials, from deposition from the air, or from transfer from surfaces or clothing. This diagram from Schneider and co-authors is a conceptual model of dermal exposure. The diagram shows several different compartments, starting with the source compartment where a potentially hazardous material could be released into the work environment. From there, the material may move into other compartments, including the air, a surface contaminant layer, outer and inner clothing contaminant layers, and a skin contaminant layer, which can be thought of as contaminants on the skin that have yet to permeate into the skin. Arrows on the diagram illustrate different ways by which materials can move from one compartment to another. In yellow, we have arrows tracking emission from the source. As shown on the previous slide, emission can result in materials moving into the air or into surface, clothing, or skin contaminant layers. Arrows highlighted in red show deposition from the air onto surface, clothing, or skin contaminant layers. Transfer processes such as touching or brushing against a surface, shown in pink, can lead to movement of materials from a surface contaminant layer into a clothing or skin contaminant layer. Transfer can also occur from clothing onto the skin. In this diagram, there are separate compartments for outer and inner clothing. So there can also be transfer from the outer clothing to the inner clothing, and from the inner clothing to the skin. Working in the opposite direction of emission, deposition, and transfer, which work to increase exposure, there are processes which work to decrease exposure. These processes are highlighted in green and include resuspension and evaporation, which is the reverse of deposition. An example of this is when someone brushes dust off their clothing or a surface, causing particles to become airborne. Similarly, removal processes are the reverse of transfer processes. Redistribution is the movement of materials between similar compartments. For example, materials may move from one airspace to another, from one piece of outer clothing to another, or from one part of the skin to another. Decontamination is deliberate removal of a material from one of the compartments. Examples include wiping a work surface, laundering clothes, washing hands, and taking a shower. Finally, highlighted in blue, materials can pass from the skin contaminant layer through the stratum corneum, the topmost layer of the skin, and enter the body. Let's look at the structure of the skin, 
moving from the epidermis, the outermost layer, through the dermis and into the subcutaneous tissue. The epidermis is the protective layer of skin. It contains openings for hair to penetrate and for sweat pores. The dermis contains nerves, capillaries, sweat glands, and hair follicles. It contains sebaceous glands that produce oily matter that lubricates the skin and hair, and erector pili muscles, the muscles that make your hair stand on end. The subcutaneous layer contains arteries, veins, and fatty tissues. Once an agent, whether it's a nanomaterial or not, penetrates through the epidermis, there is the potential for absorption into the body in the dermis or subcutaneous layer. Looking more closely at the structure of the epidermis, at the bottom is the stratum basale, the basal layer, where there is formation of new cells that work their way upwards over time to eventually become the outermost layer of skin. Above the basal layer is the stratum spinosum, the spinous layer. Above that is the stratum granulosum, the granular cell layer, which is where the cells start to deteriorate, become flattened, and begin to release lipids. Then, at the top of the epidermis is the stratum corneum. The cells here are dead and very flat, and they become the harder protective layer of the skin. Therefore, the stratum corneum is the skin's most critical barrier for preventing unwanted penetration of hazardous agents into the body. This diagram from Poland et al. shows a couple of layers of skin representing layers of the epidermis, for example, to illustrate terms related to the movement of materials through the skin. Arrow A demonstrates permeation, where a material can enter the layer but does not necessarily go through. Penetration, shown by arrow B, is the capability of an agent to pass through a layer of the skin. So when you pass into a layer, you have permeated it. When you pass through the layer, you have penetrated it. If a material penetrates all the layers of the epidermis, as shown by arrow C, it has the potential to be absorbed into the body. This is a model of the stratum corneum, the outermost layer of the epidermis, and how it may be penetrated. The model depicts the stratum corneum to be like bricks and mortar. The bricks are the cells, and the mortar is the stuff between the cells. Different pathways exist by which agents of concern can penetrate the brick wall of the stratum corneum. One pathway is the transependageal route by which an agent can penetrate the stratum corneum through skin pores. Two pathways qualify as transepidermal routes. Agents moving by the transcellular pathway go right through the cells, which is possible for water-soluble agents because the cells, the bricks, are hydrophilic. Fat-soluble agents, on the other hand, penetrate the stratum corneum by the intercellular route because the material between the cells, the mortar, is lipophilic. We are going to discuss three approaches for assessing the risk of dermal exposures. The first will be qualitative judgments in which we determine a hazard rating for skin exposures to a particular agent, then determine a dermal exposure rating for a task being performed, and finally use the two ratings with a qualitative judgment matrix to evaluate risk. A second approach is the DREAM method, an imperfect acronym for the Dermal Exposure Assessment Method, which relies on the conceptual model we already looked at for dermal exposure. The DREAM method allows us to make semi-quantitative evaluations of exposure risk. The third approach is to make quantitative judgments, in which we establish a workplace dermal exposure limit for an agent, estimate a dermal absorbed dose from measured or tabulated values, and then compare the absorbed dose to the dermal exposure limit we've established to evaluate exposure risk. This diagram shows a qualitative judgment matrix. The matrix has a dermal hazard rating on the vertical axis and a dermal exposure rating on the horizontal axis. We can see that as the dermal exposure and hazard ratings increase, the risk level increases from green or low risk through yellow or moderate risk and orange or high risk to red or very high risk. The risk categories can be used to establish priorities for further evaluation or for potential control measures to reduce dermal exposures. We can imagine an approach where we might use ratings of 1 to 4 for both the dermal hazard rating and the dermal exposure rating. Then, for example, if we have a hazard rating of 2 and an exposure rating of 3, we would be in an orange square or the high risk category 
and we could make some exposure control decisions based on this level of risk. What are the steps to performing a qualitative dermal risk assessment? First, we need to make a dermal hazard assessment. Second, a dermal exposure assessment. Third, we make a determination of exposure acceptability. What is the overall risk? A fourth step that we'll only touch on indirectly is to gather additional information to possibly make a more informed decision using a higher level of assessment, going from a qualitative assessment to a semi-quantitative or quantitative assessment. A decision to pursue a higher level of assessment might be based on the exposure acceptability determination. A very high risk in a qualitative assessment suggests the need for a more detailed analysis. Step one of a qualitative dermal risk assessment is to make a dermal hazard assessment. First, we characterize the hazard. What health effects can be caused by dermal exposure to a chemical or material of interest? Here, we think about hazard as being equivalent to the toxicity of the chemical or material. Then, we perform a rudimentary dose response assessment for the material. How toxic is it by the dermal route? Determining the dermal hazard potential is key rather than focusing on other routes of exposure. Many dermal hazard assessment resources are available. There are safety data sheets, or SDSs, that come with chemicals and should be available both as hard copies and online. SDSs may contain useful information for assessing the hazards posed by the chemicals to the skin. Process flow diagrams, if available, may help occupational hygienists understand how the work is performed and where there are opportunities for dermal exposures. The Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals, or GHS, can help us understand hazards from particular chemicals through the labeling required on chemical containers. Documents from government agencies and professional organizations on health effects caused by chemicals often contain skin notations. These documents may come from NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the European Commission Scientific Committee on Occupational Exposure Limits, and TERA, the Toxicology Excellence for Risk Assessment Center, which runs the Occupational Alliance for Risk Science that administers the WHEELS, or the Workplace Environmental Exposure Levels. A nonprofit company called SRC Incorporated maintains a large database on many different chemicals, and dermal hazard information for these chemicals may be available through this database. Gestis is a free database containing occupational limit values for hazardous substances gathered from a variety of countries. Toxnet is the U.S. National Institutes of Health database on hazardous chemicals. The European Union risk phrases provide information on dermal hazards from different chemicals. The REACH initiative, the European Union's Registration, Evaluation, Authorization, and Restriction of Chemicals, has a large database on potential exposure pathways and the potential risk posed by these exposures. Published and non-published research studies can also be used to try to assess the risk from dermal exposures. We can use a dermal hazard rating scale that runs from 1 to 4. A rating of 1 is the lowest hazard rating and represents a reversible or very low skin or systemic toxicity. A rating of 2 represents moderate but reversible skin or systemic toxicity. Level 3 is irreversible or chronic skin or systemic toxicity or sensitization. Finally, a rating of 4 represents life-threatening skin or systemic toxicity or sensitization. Step two of a qualitative dermal risk assessment is to make a dermal exposure assessment. We start by making initial workplace observations, and then these observations can be used in combination with heuristics to characterize key exposure determinants. Heuristics are experience-based techniques for problem solving, learning, and discovery that give a solution which is not guaranteed to be optimal. Where exhaustive data collection is impractical, Heuristic methods are used to speed up the process of finding a satisfactory solution using mental shortcuts such as checklists and frameworks. Everyone uses heuristics all the time. Sometimes, however, the heuristics we use lead us to incorrect decisions. Therefore, having formal checklists and frameworks can help us to make better decisions. 
Initially, we should observe worker practices and interactions with the chemicals so that we can ask a whole range of questions to gather more information. Do workers have direct contact with potentially hazardous dermal agents via bare skin, or do they wear personal protective equipment, or PPE? Is splashing a risk if the worker is handling a liquid? How do exposures occur? Are they by direct emission, or by deposition from the air, or by transfer from surfaces? And do work practices differ among workers? How are tools shared in the workplace, and are those tools cleaned or disinfected between uses? How is the housekeeping in the workplace? In most cases, better housekeeping leads to lower exposures. What are the environmental conditions in each work area? Temperature, humidity, and similar factors. How frequently do workers wash their hands, and what is their overall level of hygiene? These can all be important factors in relation to assessing and rating exposures. Key exposure determinants include the dermal contact area, how much of the skin is contacted by the agent, the dermal loading or concentration, how much of the agent of concern is in the material to which workers are exposed. The agent of concern may only be a small percentage of the overall liquid or solid that contacts the skin. The dermal contact frequency, the percentage of the workday over which the exposure occurs, or the number of times during the day that a repeated contact occurs. The dermal retention time, if a liquid agent is volatile or a solid agent is comprised of light fluffy particles, they may not stay on the skin for very long, whereas non-volatile liquids and sticky particles may be hard to remove. And dermal penetration potential, the ability of an agent to pass through the skin. As shown in the diagram, all of these factors contribute to the overall dermal exposure potential for a material. None is more important than the others. Let's step through each of the key exposure determinants individually, starting with dermal contact area. If the agent of concern is a systemic toxicant that can affect the entire body, the approach is to estimate the total area of likely skin contact. So, for example, is a worker potentially exposed through only one hand, through both hands, only through the fingers, or across a larger area? For potent allergens or corrosive agents, we estimate just the area of the specific regions of the skin that would be directly affected by an exposure. For these area estimates, we assume that no personal protective equipment, like gloves or protective clothing, is being used. PPE recommendations are part of the exposure management decisions at the conclusion of the dermal risk assessment. The rating scale for dermal contact area is from 1 to 4. If contact with the agent of concern is unlikely, a rating of 1 is given. If a very small area of skin is likely to come in contact with the agent, a rating of 2 is given. A rating of 3 is for contact possible to the hands and forearms, and a rating of 4 is for contact possible to a larger area of the skin than just the hands and forearms. We'll look next at dermal loading and or concentration, where concentration is the amount of the agent of concern per unit volume of the material contacting the skin, and loading is the amount of the agent per unit area of skin. For local irritants, concentrations contacting the skin will affect the severity of the reaction and future reactions. For allergens, their concentrations will affect the rate of sensitization of the exposed population. For systemic toxicants, on the other hand, the overall loading, not the concentration, will affect the penetration rate, or the flux, through the skin. The rating scale is once again from 1 to 4. A rating of 1 is given to a negligible concentration of agent likely to contact or load onto the skin. A rating of 2 is for low concentration of an agent likely to come in contact with or load onto the skin. A rating of 3 is for moderate concentrations, and high concentrations are given a rating of 4. Those performing these qualitative assessments must apply some professional judgment about what is a high, moderate, or low concentration in the material contacting the skin. For the dermal contact frequency, we estimate the frequency of contacts or the percentage of the total task during which the agent of concern comes in contact with the skin. The length of the task must be considered relative to the number of repeated contacts with the skin, 
With a rating scale of 1 to 4, a rating of 1 is for when there is minimal contact with the skin, one or two incidental contacts, or contact during less than 5% of the work task. A rating of 2 is for up to 10 incidental contacts or contact during less than 10% of the task. A rating of 3 is given for up to 50 incidental contacts with the skin or contact during less than 50% of the task. Finally, a rating of 4 is for routine incidental contact with the skin throughout the work task or for contact during 50 to 100% of the task. Next is dermal retention time. For this factor, we want to estimate the likelihood that the agent of concern will remain on the skin after contact occurs. As mentioned previously, we should consider factors such as vapor pressure and particle characteristics when making this determination. The rating scale is once again from 1 to 4, with a rating of 1 meaning the amount transferred is unlikely to remain on the skin for any period of time. This would apply to highly volatile liquids and particles that are dry and powdery. A rating of 2 is given to materials with some volatility or adherence to the skin. So these materials may remain on the skin for some time. A rating of 3 is for materials that are likely to remain on the skin for a significant amount of time. These would include liquids with low volatility and relatively high molecular weight, and particles that are sticky or consolidated on the skin, even if they're not visible. The highest rating is given to materials for which the amount transferred is very likely to remain on the skin. So this includes liquids that are not volatile, certainly with molecular weight greater than 100, and particles that are very likely to stick to the skin. The last key exposure determinant is dermal penetration potential. There are a variety of factors that can either increase or decrease absorption through the skin. These include the molecular weight of a liquid or the size of particles. The solubility of the material can be critical. When the logarithm of the octanol water partition coefficient is between 1 and 3, there is a high potential for dermal absorption. Other factors include the condition of the skin, with damaged or injured skin having a greater risk of absorption, and environmental conditions like temperature and humidity that can alter the surface of the skin, making penetration more or less likely. As for the other determinants, the rating scale for penetration potential goes from 1 to 4. A rating of 1 is given to large insoluble particles that can rarely penetrate the skin. A rating of 2 is for small insoluble particles larger than 1 micrometer in size and for liquids with both poor lipid and poor water solubility. These materials have only a small likelihood of penetrating the skin. A rating of 3 is given when penetration is possible but slow. This rating applies when particles are smaller than one micrometer and when liquids have some lipid solubility and some water solubility, or when there is some injury or damage to the skin. The highest rating of four applies when penetration is probable or likely, such as when a liquid has both good lipid and water solubility, or when the skin is in poor health. The third step of a qualitative dermal risk assessment is to come up with a risk rating which will be a function of both the dermal hazard rating and the dermal exposure rating. The hazard rating shown on the vertical axis runs from 1 to 4 with each number assigned to a row in the qualitative judgment matrix. We have five factors going into the exposure rating, each with its own scale of 1 to 4. Multiplying all possible combinations of the factors gives a scale of 1 to 1024. The scale on the horizontal axis for the dermal exposure rating is divided into four intervals, one for each column. The lowest interval is from 1 to 16, the second is from 16 to 64, the third is from 64 to 256, and the final interval is from 256 to 1024. We calculate the exposure rating by multiplying the ratings from each of the key exposure determinants together and then placing the product in the appropriate column based on the scale on the horizontal axis. Combining the row from the hazard rating with the column from the exposure rating gives us the exposure acceptability or risk rating in the matrix. Let's look at an example. N-hexane is a volatile organic compound used in automobile brake repair. In April of 2000, the California Air Resources Board voted to ban the use of chlorinated solvents in auto cleaning products. 
Subsequently, there was a spike in cases of nerve damage, including peripheral neuropathy, among brake mechanics, possibly due to substitution of hexane in brake cleaners in place of the chlorinated solvents. A question we might be interested in is, should we be concerned about dermal exposures to N-hexane and their effects on worker health? You can start to answer this question using a qualitative dermal risk assessment. For this example, data that may be useful include the following. About 30% of new brake cleaner is N-hexane. Mechanics spend about 60% of their workday changing brakes. The molecular weight of hexane is 86. The logarithm of the octanol water partition coefficient is 3.9, which is outside of the ideal range of 1 to 3. The vapor pressure is 151 millimeters of mercury at 25 degrees Celsius, so it's pretty volatile. The safety data sheet indicates that N-hexane is an inhalation hazard and a skin irritant, but there is no skin notation for toxicity. Globally harmonized system information also indicates that hexane is a skin irritant and furthermore mentions that single or repeated exposures to 5% solutions, less concentrated than in brake cleaner, may contribute to reproductive toxicity, although the exposure route is not specified. This uncertainty in exposure route suggests that some protection against dermal exposures may be warranted to guard against this health outcome. Lastly, OSHA indicates that N-hexane may be a skin irritant and contribute to systemic toxicity via dermal exposures. So, what do we do with these data? Let's start with a dermal hazard assessment, step one in a qualitative dermal risk assessment. As we just talked about, the safety data sheet indicates an inhalation hazard and that N-hexane is a skin irritant, but that there's no skin notation. Globally harmonized system information also indicates that hexane is a skin irritant and provides the notation on reproductive toxicity. How do we interpret this notation? The notation does not indicate that an exposure is life-threatening to the worker, but there is a potential for an irreversible reproductive effect, which is a cause for concern. OSHA indicates that N-hexane is potentially a skin irritant and may contribute to systemic toxicity, possibly from dermal exposures. In addition, there is also the reported spike in cases of nerve damage among brake mechanics after the switch to hexane-based solvents from chlorinated solvents. So from the rating scale, in my view, the dermal hazard for this exposure scenario deserves a rating of 3 because there is a potential for nerve damage and especially reproductive effects that may be irreversible. Step 2 is the dermal exposure assessment. There is contact possible to hands and forearms, so a contact area rating of 3 makes sense. Because the concentration of N-hexane in brake cleaner is 30%, which is a relatively significant concentration, a loading and or concentration rating of 3 seems appropriate. Those who are exposed are working on brakes for 60% of their workday, and they are likely using the brake cleaner regularly throughout this task. Therefore, a contact frequency rating of 4 is appropriate for routine contact throughout the task. A rating of 2 makes sense for retention time because N-hexane is relatively volatile and will not remain on a worker's skin too long. For penetration potential, a rating of 3 seems appropriate because N-hexane has some lipid solubility and some water solubility. Its octanol water partition coefficient is outside the optimal range, which indicates that a rating of 4 would be too high. When we combine these five ratings, 3 times 3 times 4 times 2 times 3, we get a product of 216. Moving on to step 3, we have a dermal hazard rating of 3 and a dermal exposure rating of 216. When we combine the ratings on the qualitative judgment matrix diagram, we end up in the orange zone, which represents a risk category of high. How might we respond to this? Instead of using thin disposable gloves that only cover the hands, we might recommend thicker long sleeve chemical protective gloves. Work practices might be altered to reduce brake cleaner use. We might also look at alternative brake cleaners that have reduced N-hexane concentrations or use a less toxic solvent. So that's an example of how we can perform a qualitative risk assessment for dermal exposures.
Next, let's look at the Dermal Exposure Assessment Method, or DREAM, which is a semi-quantitative approach. The DREAM method is based on the conceptual model of dermal exposure from Schneider and co-authors that we looked at earlier. In the DREAM approach, this complicated model is simplified. In the simplified model, we have the same basic compartments, but we consider fewer pathways. Emission of a material from a source, E, transfer of the material from a surface, T, and deposition of the material from the air, D, all lead directly to clothing contamination. The DREAM model assumes that any skin that has the potential of being exposed to the agent of concern may be covered with some kind of clothing, either work clothes or PPE. The clothing protection factor, O, represents the fraction of the agent on the clothing contaminant layer that passes through the clothing to the skin contaminant layer. As established by Van Bendel, De Jude, and co-authors, the DREAM approach is more complex than a qualitative dermal risk assessment. We're not making direct measurements, but we will use a lot more information with DREAM than in a qualitative assessment. The approach is laid out in this figure. At the top, we start by categorizing the rates of emission, deposition, and transfer of the agent of concern to clothing that is covering a worker's skin. The first equation on the right shows that the potential dermal exposure estimate is the sum of the estimates of emission, deposition, and transfer. The subscript BP is for body part because calculations are performed for each body part and then the total exposure for a worker is estimated from the sum for all body parts. The second, third, and fourth equations on the right are the individual equations for calculating emission, deposition, and transfer. Each of them have a similar format. Each includes a probability which represents the frequency of exposure an intensity that represents the fraction of the body part surface that can come in contact with the agent, an intrinsic emission that increases for liquids that are less viscous or particles that are easily dispersed, and an exposure route factor that reflects the higher impact of exposures by direct emission than by transfer and deposition. Each of the factors in these equations is determined using its own rating scale. Returning to the flow diagram on the left, after categorizing the rates of emission, deposition, and transfer to obtain a potential dermal exposure estimate, we apply a clothing protection factor for each body part to obtain an actual dermal exposure estimate. The clothing protection factor is the fraction expected to penetrate the clothing. Clothing that is more protective will have a smaller clothing protection factor. The actual dermal exposure estimates for each body part are added together for a total actual dermal exposure for a task. These estimates are weighted by the time spent on each task to determine a total actual time weighted semi-quantitative exposure estimate. We can see that this is a much more complex process compared to the qualitative assessment. In the Van Vendel de Jude et al. paper, DREAM was applied to a worker who removes metal connection rods from a milling machine. During this task, the worker can be exposed to a cooling agent that's inside the milling machine. On the front axis of this three-dimensional graph, we have different parts of the body, head, upper arms, forearms, hands, front of the torso, back of the torso, lower body parts, lower legs, and feet. On the axis coming out of the screen, we have the emission, deposition, and transfer pathways, the potential dermal exposure, which is the sum of those three pathways for each body part, and the actual dermal exposure, which is reduced from the potential exposure by the clothing protection factor. From the dream estimate on the vertical axis, we see that the greatest risk of potential exposure is through the hands, although there are significant exposures through the forearms, the lower body, and the front of the torso. The exposure to the hands is driven by transfer from a surface contaminant layer, likely the cooling agent on the rods that the worker handles. The actual exposure to the hands is significantly reduced from the potential exposure because the worker is protected by clothing. However, it appears that the forearms are not covered with clothing in this scenario because the potential and actual dermal exposures for the forearms are essentially the same. Perhaps the worker wears a short sleeve shirt and gloves that only go up to the wrist. 
As a result, the forearms become a more significant route of dermal exposure than the hands, even though there is much more transfer to the hands than the forearms. This suggests that the worker should wear a long sleeve shirt or longer chemical protective gloves that cover the forearms. So, the prevalent routes of exposure and locations on the body will dictate control measures. In this example, because transfer is most important, gloves and clothing that are protective are likely to reduce exposure substantially. We could also, of course, consider using a different type of cooling agent that is less toxic or altering work practices that reduce contact with the cooling agent. When qualitative or semi-quantitative approaches do not provide enough detail to characterize an exposure scenario sufficiently, quantitative methods may be needed. What additional information might we be able to gather? One thing we might be able to do is to perform a quantitative assessment of skin contact. Perhaps we could model dermal exposures during specific work tasks. We could sample the skin and perform chemical analyses on the samples to assess exposure. We could even perform biomonitoring of workers to assess internal doses to relevant chemicals to which the workers may be exposed by the dermal route. To estimate dermal exposures quantitatively, we should start with the American Industrial Hygiene Association's conceptual model for dermal exposure assessment, develop an occupational exposure limit equivalent for dermal exposures, and utilize currently available tools to assess exposures and compare them to the OEL equivalent. These are the steps in a quantitative dermal risk assessment. To begin, we calculate a dermal occupational exposure limit equivalent, which is like the dermal hazard rating from the qualitative approach. Next, we consider the AIHA conceptual model for dermal exposure and use the model to estimate exposure determinants, which is like setting the values used to establish a dermal exposure rating in the qualitative approach. Finally, we make decisions about exposure acceptability using these quantitative pieces of information. So, step one is to calculate a dermal occupational exposure limit equivalent. In most cases, there is no existing OEL specific to dermal exposures. Therefore, we will derive one from an occupational exposure limit for inhalation exposures. For moderate work activity, inhalation rates for U.S. workers are typically 11 to 19 cubic meters of air per day. An easy to use value of 10 cubic meters of air per day allows us to calculate an occupational exposure limit equivalent that is lower and more protective than if we were to use a value in the 11 to 19 cubic meters per day range. The dermal OEL equivalent in milligrams per day is the product of the inhalation based OEL in milligrams per cubic meter of air times 10 cubic meters of air per day. This dermal OEL equivalent is, in essence, a limit for the absorbed dose rate through the skin for the material of interest. Step two is to consider the American Industrial Hygiene Association conceptual model for dermal exposure assessment. The conceptual model uses the five key exposure determinants that we considered for a qualitative dermal risk assessment, contact area, loading and or concentration, contact frequency, retention time, and penetration potential. These five exposure determinants can be estimated quantitatively and combined to yield a quantitative dermal exposure estimate. In the AIHA conceptual model, the absorbed dose rate, D, in milligrams per day is equal to the surface area, S, of the skin coming into contact with the material containing the agent of concern, times the amount of the material, Q, retained on the skin, times the weight fraction, WF, of the agent of concern in the material, times the number or frequency of contact events per day, FQ, multiplied by the fractional absorption, ABS, or penetration of the agent through the skin, which may be chosen as a default of 100%, a fraction of one, or taken from values found in the literature or derived from empirical approaches. Step three is to use this equation to estimate the exposure determinants and come up with a dose rate. The surface area of skin can be estimated using the Exposure Factors Handbook from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The amount of the material retained on the skin can be measured using dermal sampling. 
If measurements are not possible, there are also estimates available in the literature for amounts of various materials that are retained on skin. The weight fraction of the agent of concern may be listed in a safety data sheet or it can be estimated. The frequency of contact can be counted or estimated through observation. And the absorption can be determined from the literature or it can be estimated using software that we'll look at in a little while called IH skin perm. This table shows skin surface areas for an average man from the EPA Exposure Factors Handbook. We can see that total body area is approximately 20,600 square centimeters. That's roughly two square meters. The trunk is the biggest portion of that. The legs are second biggest, arms third biggest, and the head, hands, and feet are all smaller. The arms are also separated into the upper and lower arms and the legs are separated into the thighs and the lower legs. So we can estimate exposed skin surface areas using these data. The amounts of materials that are retained on skin, or Q values, have been experimentally evaluated in units of mass per surface area of the skin, also referred to as surface density. From the EPA Exposure Factors Handbook, most solids are retained in the range of 0.13 to 0.27 milligram per square centimeter. Liquids can be retained at up to 10 milligrams per square centimeter, although 0.5 to 2 milligrams per square centimeter is more typical. Ideally, however, dermal sampling data will be used. Both direct and indirect methods can be used to sample skin. Surface wipes, collection pads, skin washes, and tape stripping are among the methods available. We can classify the different dermal sampling methods into three categories. Surrogate skin methods, removal techniques, and imaging methods. Surrogate skin methods involve a worker performing a task while wearing something to intercept and capture the material of interest before it comes in contact with the skin. One approach is to use absorbent patches as illustrated by this image from Lilialind and co-authors. Here we see a subject wearing gloves that have six patches with absorbent materials attached to them. After a task is performed or at the end of a workday, these patches can be removed and analyzed to try to measure how much material is present on the skin. Similar analyses can be performed using chemical protective gloves or even whole body suits. Materials collected can be washed from the surface of the gloves or bodysuit after the worker takes them off and then analyzed chemically. Removal techniques try to recover and analyze materials that have collected on the skin. One method is to have workers carefully wash their skin and to collect the wash liquid for chemical analysis. This is likely to be most effective for hands and forearms. There are also wiping techniques, as illustrated by Beruzzi et al., where the skin is wiped after exposure, materials are later eluded from the wipes, and then the eluate is analyzed chemically. Another approach is tape stripping, where tape is applied to the skin surface after exposure and pulled back off. Then, either a chemical or microscopic analysis may be performed on material attached to the tape. This technique is most useful for particle exposures. Imaging methods look at the surface of the skin to try to detect materials in situ or in place on the skin. Because these methods are based on the ability of the agent of interest to fluoresce, as shown in this image, they are applicable in only a limited number of situations. For example, this approach has been used for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which fluoresce well. However, imaging methods do not work for most agents, and the limits of detection are relatively high meaning it may be hard to detect agents like nanomaterials that are likely to be present in very small quantities. For the absorption rate, the default value can be set to 100%, which is the most conservative or most protective assumption. However, complete absorption is unlikely in most cases. For example, because substances with high vapor pressure are likely to evaporate rapidly, significant absorption is unlikely. Similarly, particles large molecules, and insoluble liquids will have a hard time penetrating through the skin. Values for percentage absorbed exist in the published literature for some materials. Published data for toluene, for example, indicate that only about 4% will be absorbed. Lastly, we can look at the software IH Skin Perm, which contains absorption rate information for many chemicals.
Step four in a quantitative dermal risk assessment is to make a decision based on the occupational exposure limit equivalent and the absorbed dose rate estimate. The relationship between those values can be placed into one of four categories, which are the same as the American Industrial Hygiene Association's exposure category rating scheme. Category one is for when the dose rate estimate is less than 10% of the OEL equivalent. Category two is for when the dose rate is between 10 and 50% of the OEL equivalent. Category three is for when the dose rate is between 50% of the OEL equivalent and the OEL equivalent. And category four is for when the dose rate estimate is greater than the OEL equivalent. The recommendations for control measures based on these categories are for category one, to use good general industrial hygiene practices. For category two, consider process modification, substitution of different chemicals, isolation of the worker from the process or the process from the worker, better cleaning routines, improved training, better hygiene procedures for individual workers, better laundering of clothing, skin care programs, use of disposable gloves, and skin condition reporting by workers. For category three, consider everything in category two plus full containment of the process, thicker chemical protective gloves rather than disposable gloves, the use of other personal protective equipment, chemical protective clothing perhaps, and also, rather than self-reporting of skin conditions, having a skin surveillance program with dermal observation by clinicians. For category four, advice should be sought from specialists in exposure control methods, especially engineering controls. Let's take a look at an example of how to perform a quantitative dermal risk assessment. The image on this slide is of an employee who is reconnecting 20 transfer lines inside a manufacturing plant over the course of a workday. The transfer liquid contains 15% toluene by weight. The worker's hands can potentially be exposed to the transfer liquid. The TLV for toluene is 20 parts per million, which is equivalent to 75 milligrams per cubic meter. We multiply the TLV by the suggested inhalation rate of 10 cubic meters per day to give an OEL equivalent of 750 milligrams per day for the absorbed dose rate through the skin. To calculate dose, we need to think about each of the five key determinants of dermal exposure. Exposure is likely to occur only through the front of the hands. This would be about half of the total surface area of the hands listed in the EPA Exposure Factors Handbook, or about 535 square centimeters. Because exposure is from a liquid, we can estimate the amount of the liquid retained on the skin to be about 2.0 milligrams per square centimeter. An alternative would be to perform wipe sampling or use absorbent pads on the worker to measure the amount retained on the skin. The weight fraction of toluene in the transfer liquid is 15% or 0.15. The frequency or number of contacts is 20 per day. And for now, we are going to use the default assumption of 100% or 1.0 for absorption through the skin. When we apply all of these factors, we have 535 square centimeters times 2.0 milligrams per square centimeter times 0.15 for the weight fraction times 20 contacts per day, times 1.0 for the default absorption, which gives us an absorbed dose rate of 3,200 milligrams per day. Then, our exposure category can be determined by dividing our estimated dose rate of 3,200 milligrams per day by the OEL equivalent dose rate of 750 milligrams per day, which is about 4.3 or 430%. This is clearly a category four exposure in the exposure category rating scheme. With this category rating, we would seek advice from specialists in exposure control. If, instead of using the default assumption for absorption, we look for data for absorption, we can find data in the literature that indicate that only 4% of toluene in contact with the skin ends up being absorbed. This is a huge difference from the default assumption. 4% or 0.04 rather than 100% or 1.0. When this revised factor is plugged into the equation, our new estimate for the absorbed dose rate is 130 milligrams per day rather than 3,200 milligrams per day.
This new estimate is only 17% of the OEL equivalent rather than 430%, giving us an exposure rating category of 2 rather than 4. So, with this more accurate absorption value, we can consider process modification, substitution of different chemicals, isolation of the worker from the process, better cleaning routines, improved training, better hygiene procedures, better laundering of clothes, skin care programs, use of disposable gloves, and skin condition reporting instead of immediately consulting with an expert in exposure controls. There is one more alternative to consider for this example, using IH skin perm to calculate the absorption. The scenario is the same. The affected skin area is 535 square centimeters. IH skin perm also requires a dermal deposition rate as input. This is the amount of material being admitted, transferred, or deposited on the skin in units of milligrams per square centimeter per hour. We can estimate this value from the amount retained on the skin, which we took as 2.0 milligrams per square centimeter, times the 0.15 weight fraction, times the 20 contacts per day, divided by an estimate of 8 hours of work per day, which gives us 0.75 milligram per square centimeter per hour. Let's take a look at IH Skin Perm, which you can download at this website from the Exposure Assessment Strategies Committee of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. The download is a Microsoft Excel macro-enabled worksheet. From this first screen, we can click into the data input page. We will use the SkinPerm internal database and choose toluene as our substance. Instead of instantaneous deposition, we're considering deposition over time because we have 20 contacts per day. The affected skin area is 535 square centimeters. The skin adherence for solids is not relevant in this scenario, so we will leave the default value in place. We estimated a dermal deposition rate of 0.75 milligram per square centimeter per hour. The IH Skin Perm documentation recommends that we set the thickness of stagnant air to one centimeter for uncovered skin. We will start the deposition at the beginning of the workday and end at the completion of an eight hour workday. We will carry out the scenario for 24 hours because material on the skin may still penetrate after the workday ends. Next, we hit the start button to see our estimates. So here we have a deposition rate of 401 milligrams of toluene per hour for a total deposition of 3,210 milligrams during the eight hour workday. Of the deposited toluene, 6.9% was absorbed for a total dose of 223 milligrams of toluene for the day. The top figure shows in black the mass of toluene estimated to deposit on the skin surface over time. In magenta, how much will evaporate over time. In orange, how much is in the stratum corneum. And in green, how much is absorbed into the body. The bottom figure shows estimates for the absorption rate in milligrams per hour as a function of time. After eight hours, there is very little additional absorption because most of the toluene either evaporates or penetrates the skin rapidly. We can take the dose rate of 223 milligrams of toluene per day from IH skin perm and divide it by our OEL equivalent of 750 milligrams per day, which is about 0.30 or 30%. This yields an exposure rating category of two which is the same category as our calculation using the equation with a dermal absorption of 4% for toluene. Now let's focus some on what is known about dermal exposures to nanomaterials.
These data come from a presentation by Dirk Brewer in which he reviews the literature and experiments that he and his co-authors conducted regarding the penetration or permeation of various nanoparticles through or into the skin. The data indicate that titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are unable to either penetrate or permeate the skin. On the other hand, cadmium selenide quantum dots are able to both penetrate and permeate the skin, and cadmium is released during this process. Silica nanoparticles are able to penetrate through the skin, but not permeate the skin. They may be going through hair follicles or sweat pores. Cobalt, nickel, and palladium nanoparticles are able to penetrate and permeate the skin, likely due to the release of ions from the particles rather than whole particles making it through. Platinum and rhodium nanoparticles, even at very, very small sizes, are only able to penetrate through damaged skin. They are not able to permeate into the skin. This summary shows that there is the potential for some kinds of nanoparticles to penetrate and permeate the skin. Unfortunately, the assessments of dermal penetration potential for nanomaterials are very limited so far. Therefore, we have an incomplete understanding of the broad risks posed by dermal exposures to nanomaterials. Brewer et al. report some general trends about the effects of nanoparticle size and composition on penetration and permeation. Looking first at the influence of particle size, particles that are smaller than 4 nanometers in diameter are able to both penetrate and permeate intact skin. Particles between 4 and 20 nanometers in diameter have the potential to permeate into both intact and damaged skin. For particles between 21 and 40 nanometers in diameter, there is a risk of going through and into only damaged skin. Particles larger than 40 nanometers demonstrate little ability to penetrate or permeate the skin, even if the skin is damaged. In regard to the influence of particle composition, toxic metals such as cadmium from quantum dots can pass through the skin and into the body, as can metal ions from metal and metal oxide nanoparticles. Impurities in carbon-based nanoparticles, such as metals used as catalysts in the formation of fullerenes and carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, can also be absorbed through the skin. As we discussed previously, transfer from surfaces is potentially a significant pathway for dermal exposure. Brewer et al. showed data on transfer efficiency of both microscale and nanoscale particles from metal and wood surfaces. From metal surfaces, microscale particles are transferred with efficiency between 3.5 and 27 percent. Transfer efficiency for nanoscale particles is much higher. Between about half and all nanoparticles are transferred when skin comes in contact with contaminated metal surfaces. From wood, there is less transfer than from metal because wood is a rougher surface. Between about 1 and 10 percent of microscale particles are transferred by contact between contaminated wood surfaces and skin, whereas 14 to 40 percent of nanoscale particles can be transferred from wood surfaces. These data indicate that transfer from surfaces is a more important route for dermal exposures to nanoparticles than it is for exposures to larger particles. The semi-quantitative DREAM methodology has been used by Sturman to assess risks of dermal exposures from a variety of nanomaterial-related work tasks. The author looked at around 45 different nanomaterial processes and assessed the likelihood of exposures from emission, transfer, and deposition of engineered nanoparticles for each process, and then combine the pathways to estimate the overall or total likelihood of exposure. She rated the likelihood of exposure as almost impossible, very low, low, significant, and high. The small chart on the lower left focuses on four tasks with nanoparticles in liquids, and we can see that the likelihood of exposures for nanoparticles in liquid suspensions is almost impossible or very low. This matches our general principle that nanomaterials and liquids present relatively low risks of exposure. The chart on the right presents exposure assessments for tasks with dry nanomaterials. For some of the tasks, such as weighing silver powder, working at a research reactor, or weighing carbon nanotubes, the likelihood of dermal exposure is almost impossible. Tasks like production of polymers containing carbon nanotubes have very low likelihood of exposure. Vacuum cleaning, weighing fumed silica, handling small amounts of ferric oxide, and cleaning a nanoparticle reactor have low likelihood of dermal exposure. 
Tasks with significant risks of exposure include bagging dry synthetic organoclay and emptying bags of aluminum hydroxide. Finally, tasks like emptying bags, handling dry powders, compressing empty bags, suction of powder out of bins, and dumping products from bags for nanomaterials like cerium oxide and titanium dioxide have high likelihood of dermal exposure. Not surprisingly, tasks that put more energy into a nanopowder present a greater risk of dermal exposure. Sturman reorganized some of the tasks according to the type of task and found that, in general, Dumping products from bags creates a high risk of exposure, mostly due to transfer of nanomaterials from surfaces to hands. Bagging of dry powders also presents fairly significant risks, as does handling of small amounts, less than a kilogram, of nanoparticles in certain processes. These analyses show that the semi-quantitative DREAM approach can suggest tasks during which workers should be specifically protected against the risk of dermal exposure. What about dermal sampling from nanoparticles using the basic approaches we discussed a little while ago? For surrogate skin methods, it is possible to estimate the emission, deposition, and transfer pathways fairly accurately, or at least the sum of those pathways, by sampling from chemical protective clothing. However, after the nanomaterials are removed from the clothing into a suspension, there are significant challenges with chemical extraction and analytical sensitivity because such small quantities are present. In addition, information on particle size and particle agglomeration is lost with this approach. Removal techniques offer some useful opportunities. Washing and wiping techniques, unfortunately, will alter particle size and agglomeration status. As with surrogate skin methods, large chemical extraction and analysis challenges are present with washing and wiping because the nanomaterials are in a dilute suspension. Tape stripping, on the other hand, is less likely to alter particle size and agglomeration, and it is relatively easy to detect particles because they can be observed directly on the tape. In addition, nanoparticles may feasibly be sized and analyzed for composition using scanning electron microscopy. Not enough research has been conducted on tape stripping to confidently say when and where it can be used effectively but this technique probably has the greatest promise for sampling nanoparticles from skin, simply because we're not diluting the sampled particles in a substantial volume of liquid. Imaging methods are not likely to be effective for nanomaterials because it's hard to detect nanoparticles by fluorescence. Workers who are likely to suffer from skin disease based on what we know about their jobs and who also use nano-enabled products may be most at risk from dermal exposures to nanomaterials. For instance, in the healthcare sector, dental practitioners, assistants, and technicians, and nurses tend to have skin disease from their jobs, and now they are also working potentially with nanocomposites in dentistry or nanomedicines as part of patient care. Because they experience high rates of skin disease, these workers have greater risk of a significant dermal exposure than other workers who may be exposed to the same nanomaterials but are less likely to have work-related skin disease. Similarly, in the personal care sector, hairdressers and beauticians are exposed to a variety of personal care products that may contain nanomaterials, and they also tend to have skin disease. Other workers at high risk of skin disease and with potential exposures to nanomaterials include construction painters, concrete repair workers, cleaners, and auto body repair workers. We should pay special attention when evaluating dermal exposures to nanomaterials among these workers because they are more prone to having skin injuries and therefore have a greater chance of absorbing nanomaterials from the skin contaminant layer into the body. To summarize, dermal exposures to nanoparticles can occur from direct emissions, deposition from air, or transfer from contaminated surfaces or clothing. Dermal risk can be assessed using qualitative methods, semi-quantitative approaches like the DREAM method, and quantitative methods that may include dermal sampling. Bagging and dumping present the greatest risk of dermal exposures to nanomaterials, mostly from transfer pathways. And dermal sampling methods for nanoparticles present many challenges, and few studies have demonstrated these methods, so more research into sampling methods is needed. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST, program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College.
Funding for the MAPMAS program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for your attention.